The hot springs have been called a fountain of youth, the elixir of life, the certain panacea for all the ills to which the flesh is heir to. The history of the town of Hot Springs is intertwined with its springs. Here the ideal conditions coalesced. Fractured rocks, abundant water, deep faults in the earth, and just the right amount of pressure caused groundwater to become hot and return to the surface. These hot springs are the attraction that created a destination over a millennia. The first people who arrived here at least 10,000 years ago, no doubt, reveled in the hot water that was bubbling out of the ground. After the discovery of the springs by military spies in about 1778, the hot springs developed into a first-class destination for tourists from all over. Only a handful of hot springs occur in the eastern United States, all of them scattered along the Appalachian Mountains. North Carolina's only hot springs offer the hottest water of all of them, up to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Native people left their mark near hot springs about 5,000 years ago. They drew large geometric figures on the face of a cliff about 30 feet above the French Broad River Bank. This cliff is known as paint or painted rock. The site is one of the oldest of its kind in the eastern United States. It is thought to have been strategically painted at this location, a natural point of crossing on the river. It is situated along a major travel route that was used for centuries. The colonial militia built a defensive blockhouse close to the high pictograph in the 1790s. The Catawba Indian Trail number 33 from W.E. Myers' map of Indian trails of the southeastern United States ran through modern day Hendersonville in western North Carolina, north to Asheville, and then followed the French Broad River through Hot Springs, past Paint Rock, and into East Tennessee. The Cherokee hunted along the French Broad River and no doubt used the hot springs. To the Cherokee, all springs are considered sacred since they connect the middle world, where we live, to the underworld. There are many Cherokee legends in and around hot springs. One of these is the Lover's Leap. Lover's Leap is a rock outcropping on the Appalachian Trail in hot springs that offers a spectacular panoramic view of the French Broad River and the Pisgah National Forest. The legend says, the beautiful maiden named Mist on the Mountain leaped to her death, keeping the promise to her lover Magua after he was murdered by Tall Pine, the brave in which her hand in marriage was promised. Another is the legend of Dakwa, a mythological giant fish that roamed the waters six miles above Hot Springs. One day, a Cherokee hunter was traveling by canoe on the river while instantly he was thrown in the air and then swallowed whole by the Dakwa. The hunter eventually escaped by using sharp mussel shells to cut his way out of the giant fish. Until the advent of modern roads, the best way to travel through the mountains was along the river. The trail, originally formed by mountain bison and other animals, was likely used by Native Americans for countless centuries. An actual man-made road was built along the river in the late 1780s. But it was very rough and it wasn't until the 1795 that a wagon with four wheels could negotiate the route. The Rough River Road was dubbed the Drover's Road, as it provided a means for farmers to drive their livestock and bring produce to market. It was later improved and integrated into what became known as the Buncombe Turnpike, which ran 75 miles from South Carolina to Tennessee. The Turnpike, when completed in 1827, was declared 
one of the best roads in the southern states. Before the Buncombe Turnpike was built, travel along the French Broad River was rough and dangerous. Bishop Francis Asbury, a Methodist circuit rider who kept a journal, noted that wagons and horses fell off the road more than once. Asbury's fellow minister and companion in 1808 and 1809, Henry Bowen, wrote, Never can I forget those toils over the mountains, rocks, hills, stumps, trees, streams, awful roads, and dangerous passes. Travel along the French Broad River, though dangerous, was very beautiful, and still is today. After the Buncombe Turnpike made stagecoach travel possible, the Pattons, James and his two sons, James W. and John E., built a first-class hotel facing the river in 1832. This 13-columned white brick hotel opened with 250 rooms and a large bathing house. Although the large three-story Warm Springs Hotel or Patton's White House, as some called it, was luxurious. The hot springs with 105 degree mineral water was the true attraction. Harper's Magazine wrote, The approach to Warm Springs is very lovely. Crossing the river on the long bridge, we drove up to the large hotel which stands here alone, maintained in the heart of the wilderness by the maimed and the halt and the blind who come to bathe in the magical waters." Unquote. The Warm Springs Hotel attracted the wealthy who often escaped the summer heat of the lowlands for an extended stay in the mountains. Guests could bathe in and drink the 105 degree spring water as well as enjoy music, dancing, bowling, riding, and fishing reported visitor Charles Landman in 1849. Although this palatial hotel burned to the ground in 1884, a second grand resort, the four-story Mountain Park Hotel was even more impressive than the first. By October 1863, East Tennessee was a Union stronghold, while Marshall and Asheville remained staunchly Confederate. The Buncombe Turnpike linked the warring factions. On October 16th, the Union's 2nd North Carolina Mounted Infantry Regiment overran a detachment of the Confederacy's 25th North Carolina Infantry and set up their recruiting station on the grounds of the Warm Springs Hotel. The 2nd North Carolina Infantry was the first of only two Union regiments comprised of men from both sides of the North Carolina-Tennessee border, including over 70 men from the nearby Shelton Laurel community. When the Confederates learned of the Union presence in the area, members of Major John W. Woodfin's mounted battalion arrived with the goal of driving the Union soldiers out. Woodfin himself met a harsh end during this encounter. Sharpshooters positioned on the Warm Springs Hotel balcony shot him dead right off his horse as he crossed the bridge. General Robert Vance, brother of North Carolina's governor, Zebulon Vance, attacked the Union troops with both sides suffering casualties. James Henry Rumbo, a Confederate sympathizer and practicing lawyer in Greenville, Tennessee, ran a stagecoach line from there to Greenville, South Carolina. His wife Carrie and their six children moved to Warm Springs in 1862 thinking it a safer place to weather the coming war. They bought the Warm Springs Hotel, which Kerry managed during the war. Business at that time was predictably slow. Meanwhile, James served behind the lines, supplying horses and other necessities to the rebels. Left alone, Kerry was forced to face both armies, as well as hide horses, divide her food with the soldiers, and even cradled the head of a young Union soldier who lay dying. Carrie compassionately sent a lock of hair to his northern mother.
Even though Carrie's kindness was revealed in this tender gesture, she also had courage and grit. According to oral tradition, the same woman also burned the bridge over the French Broad River in an effort to prevent Union soldiers and bushwhackers from reaching the hotel. Although there was no clear victor in the Battle of Warm Springs, divided loyalties in the Western Highlands took its toll on every citizen. Revenge killings persisted for many years after the war had ended. In 1869, Tennessee completed a rail line to the North Carolina border near Wolf Creek. The East Tennessee, Virginia, and Georgia Railroad expected to connect with the Western North Carolina Railroad at that point. The North Carolina line had been chartered 17 years earlier in 1852. Construction of the railroad was completed between Salisbury and just six miles east of Morganton by 1861. The outbreak of the Civil War ended construction for the next five years. When work resumed after the war, the newly appointed president of the Western North Carolina Railroad, George Swepson, slipped out of Raleigh with $4 million in railroad construction bonds. This occurred in 1869 and brought an abrupt end to the construction for the next six years. Finally, in 1875, after a long, contentious debate, the North Carolina Legislature authorized $850,000 in additional funds and approved convict laborers to finish the line. The connection to Tennessee cost millions of dollars and an estimated 400 lives. The Western North Carolina Railroad reached Asheville on October 2nd, 1880. And within 10 years, that city's population more than doubled from 4,000 to just over 10,000 persons. Two years later, on January 25, 1882, the first train arrived at Warm Springs following the newly laid tracks along the French Broad River. The railroad followed the route of the Buncombe Turnpike, crossing to the west bank over the deep water trestle near Warm Springs. In a little more than 50 years, the highly touted Buncombe Turnpike went from innovative and invaluable to obsolete. The railroad was a faster, safer, and more reliable method of transporting livestock, goods, timber, minerals, and passengers. The trip that took the drovers from one to three months or more was shortened to days. Warm Springs was now easily accessible to the rest of North Carolina Tennessee and South Carolina, with connections to the Ohio River Valley in the north and Georgia, Florida, and Alabama to the south. From the ashes of the Warm Springs Hotel came a new modern hotel, the Mountain Park in 1884. This elegant hotel facing the railroad depot featured a quarter mile of glassed-in veranda, steam heat, gas lighting, and an elevator to serve four stories, a spacious ballroom and stage, and a skilled French chef. A newspaper article called the hotel first class and a table cannot be surpassed by any in the country. While excavating for a new bathhouse, a hot spring, 110 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit, was discovered. In June 1886, the new resort opened and the town of Warm Springs officially changed its name and that of its post office to Hot Springs. The Mountain Park Hotel built a nine-hole golf course on both sides of the main street through town. The Wanaluna Golf Club organized as the first golf club in North Carolina. The Grand Mountain Park Hotel burned to the ground in January 1920, ending a 120-year legacy of entertaining influential people from all over the country.
Reverend Luke Dorlin and wife Juliet first arrived in Hot Springs in 1886 in need of rest. Reverend Dorlin was 71 and had devoted 39 years of his life to the Presbyterian Church as a pastor and educator. Since Hot Springs did not have a school for its young people, the townspeople appealed to the couple to educate their children as soon as they learned of his experience. The compassionate Dorlins did not refuse. The Hot Springs School launched in the Dorlins dining room with a group of 25 students. More and more students were asking to attend the school. So the following year, the Dorlins built a two-story school in the back of their house for 60 students. By 1890, the school was crowded with over 100 children ages 6 to 19. Reverend Dorland appealed to the USA Presbyterian Board of Home Missions to take over the Hot Springs School in 1893. The organization pledged their support and construction began on a new five-story building that was to be used as a girls' dormitory and extra classrooms. The school was then given the Dorland Institute name. More growth followed with the construction of a boys' dormitory, farm, and additional buildings. The Walnut Community's Bell Institute merged with Dorlin in 1918 to become the Dorlin Bell School. The Dorlin Bell School continued to operate in Hot Springs until 1942 when the Mission Board transferred it to the Asheville Farm School, known today as Warren Wilson College. 1917. The elegant resort's manicured lawns were suddenly filled with rows of barracks and other associated buildings. The historic Hampton Cottage served as the camp hospital, and the luxury hotel housed the officers. Barbed wire, some of it set atop an eight-foot wood fence, encompassed the camp. The first internees were all civilians. They began to arrive by train on June 8, 1917. Hot Springs became home to some 2,300 Germans, four times the town's population at that time. The town still had no bridge, but because of the camp, a new bridge was finally completed by September 1917. The children enrolled in school with locals, and Hot Springs residents were hired as construction workers and camp guards. To pass the time, the Germans carved wood, painted, gardened, played music, participated in sports, and built a whole Bavarian village complete with houses, a church, and even a carousel. The houses were built with driftwood, flood debris, tin cans, and scrap metal with some purchase materials. Plans to move the German seamen from Hot Springs to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia were made only a year after they arrived. The move was delayed by an outbreak of typhoid fever, which tragically killed about 39 Germans. By September 1918, all of the Germans had left Hot Springs, and on November 11, 1918, the war was over. On July 8, 1916, a storm came up from the Gulf of Mexico and drenched western North Carolina with rain for six days. The effects of the storm were exacerbated by the next weather disaster, a hurricane that roared toward the mountains from Charleston, South Carolina. On July 15, the rain from the hurricane was so intense that 10 to 15 inches of rain fell in the upper French Broad watershed mostly within the brief span of 24 hours. To make matters worse, the mountain forest had recently been stripped of their standing timber, 
so the land was even more bare and vulnerable to the elements. Without the trees to buffer the torrential rains, water rolled off the mountainsides in excess and rapidly filled the rivers. The waters of the French Broad River washed away bridges and railroads. Inundated and swept away too were businesses, farms, and hundreds of homes. About 80 people died. And the financial toll from the destruction numbered in the millions of dollars. In Hot Springs, the Spring Creek and the French Broad River flooded homes and businesses. Bridges washed away, along with the Juana Luna Clubhouse at the Mountain Park Hotel, where damage was significant. Floodwaters covered the hotel grounds and its ballroom floor. Eleven Southern Railroad men were lost and miles of track were washed out. By the 1890s, an amazing number of timber companies had moved into the southern Appalachians to exploit the region's vast forests. In 1892, a company headed by James Wyman bought 38,500 acres and started a rail line from Hot Springs. After the first year of construction yielded only two and a half miles of track, the effort was abandoned. When that company shut down, Wyman sold his Madison County land to the North Carolina Land and Timber Company. Loggers began cutting trees with the plan of moving the logs by way of a series of temporary splash dams. These were opened by dynamite to release a rush of water and logs downstream to sawmills along the creeks. Loggers also used stout cattle, oxen, horses, or mules to pull the huge logs down the mountain slopes and out to the railway. Temporary rails extended up Shelton Laurel, Little Laurel, Spill Corn, Foster Creek, Pounding Mill, and other tributaries of the Big Laurel River. After the timber was cut in one hollow, the rails and cross ties would be removed and put down in the next place to be cut. In 1909, Harriet Betts of New York bought the land for the Laurel River Logging Company, headed by her son, Anson Betts. The new company began construction of the Madison County Railroad, which eventually extended 30 miles from the train depot in Runyon. Runyon became a thriving logging town with at least 200 men and a huge bandsaw that produced 30,000 feet of lumber daily. The short-lived railroad went out of business, leaving behind a Baldwin locomotive named James Wyman after the company's first president. Uh, wouldn't today be a pretty good day to go to Hot Springs? Well, I believe the day is all right. As you know, it's a pretty long, crooked road. Madison County back in the old, uh, there wasn't too much work to do. A lot of them just uh, made a lot of mountain music, you know, and they'd have these square dances at night and have a good time. The rugged mountains of Madison County have always provided a seemingly impenetrable barrier to the outside world. This isolation helped to preserve the special music and language of the English and Scottish who immigrated here. Cecil Sharp, an Englishman, regarded as the foremost historian of folk songs, discovered the richness of mountain music when he visited for the first time in 1916. Jane Gentry was a remarkable woman who sang or told stories while she labored. When Cecil Sharp and his assistant, Maud Carpelese, came to visit, she willingly sang for the English folklorist over several days. Sharp made at least eight visits to hear Jane sing and collected ballads including at least one visit to the Sunny Bank boarding house in Hot Springs. Jane was a hicks, uh, famous for their ballads and music and jack tales. When he published his collection, English Folk Songs from the Southern Appalachia, in 1917, 40 songs were from Jane Gentry. In fact, Sharp collected more songs from Jane than anyone else, a total of 70 songs.
be good to party, Ellen. Hot Springs town limits are defined by the Pisgah National Forest, and Pisgah began in 1911 with the purchase of thousands of cutover acres bought by the National Forest Service Reservation Commission. Today, this public land includes the rugged mountains along the Tennessee-North Carolina border and covers nearly a quarter of Madison County. The town of Hot Springs thrived through the 1930s, 40s, and 50s and provided most of the goods people needed. We had two bus stations with buses. We had Queen City Trailways and Greyhound lines. They would come through probably six or eight a day. We would get them at 10 o'clock in the morning and all the way through till, till night. We had four trains a day. The railroad was a big part of the life in Hot Springs. The main transportation was the Greyhound bus and it stopped right over there. The trains came through Knoxville to Asheville, Asheville to Knoxville, morning and evening. In the 1960s, engineers created an alternative to the 2570 route for through traffic. This new route went down a future Interstate 26 to a new Interstate 40 through the Pigeon River Gorge, many miles south. After the Pigeon River board section was completed, the bus route ceased and the railroad stopped running a passenger train. The only way in and out of Hot Springs became the winding highway. Indeed, this progress caused Hot Springs to become a faint shadow of its former self. This is the modern incarnation of Hot Springs Resort and Spa, but this property is timeless. We believe that Mother Nature has created here what a lot of places try to imitate artificially. This property had fallen into decline in the late 70s, early 80s. It was used as farm space and pretty much a wide spot in the road here in Hot Springs. Eugene Hicks, who was a native of Madison County, had a vision for this property. A vision that he could bring back that tradition of relaxation and healing and make this a place for everyone to experience the natural water. We believe that it's timeless. You can take a picture of hot springs and not know where you are in time. You can feel those fingers of the Mountain Park Hotel, the Patton Hotel, the Hampton Cottage. You can almost hear the sounds of people moving along the river in the Buncombe Turnpike. It's a very special piece of land. Hot Springs is the first town and one of just a few located along the AT or Appalachian Trail. Northbound hikers encounter Hot Springs about 269 miles from its origin at Springer Mountain, Georgia. Benton McKay and Myron Avery were the moving forces behind the idea and formation of the Appalachian Trail. The Appalachian Trail's first mile was cut in 1922 in a New York park. And on August 14, 1937, the Appalachian Trail was declared open from Georgia to Maine. The dedicated volunteers of 31 trail clubs from Maine to Georgia continue to maintain the AT to this day. In 1948, Earl Schaefer became the first person to hike the entire Appalachian Trail, a feat regarded as impossible until then. Schaefer served in World War II, and he said that the hike helped him recover from the stress of war and the loss of his friends. Schaefer's 1965 Maine to Georgia trail hike made him the first person to complete the AT in both directions. On the 50th anniversary of his first hike, he threw hiked again, finishing two weeks before his 80th birthday. After reading about the Appalachian Trail in National Geographic magazine, Grandma Emma Gatewood donned her kid sneakers and became the first solo female through hiker in 1955. She was 67 years old. She went on to become the first person to hike the trail three times. The second time in 1960 and the third done in sections in 1963 
when she was 75. She held the title of the oldest female thru-hiker until 2007. Surrounded by Pisgah National Forest, Hot Springs is only a 35-minute drive from Asheville, but it feels a world away. On any given summer weekend in Hot Springs, North Carolina, pack-laden hikers and paddlers in wetsuits can be seen traversing the sidewalks of this tiny, no-traffic-light Appalachian town. This beautiful southern town with a certain mountain charm has to be experienced to be understood. For thousands of years, the hot mineral water has been rising to the surface in hot springs. Today, guests can once again soak in the hot, healing mineral waters for health, pleasure, peace, and maybe an extended life, just as thousands of other visitors have done for a millennia.